topic. We believe in the power of exploration, wonder, and storytelling to change our world for the better. This Explorer Classroom YouTube show connects students from all around the world with our National Geographic Explorers for short lessons and time for all of your student questions. Today, we're very lucky to be connecting with Explorer Melanie Kirby. Melanie is, the, is a member of the Tortugas Pueblo from Southern New Mexico. As a Fulbright National Geographic Storytelling Fellow, Melanie has traveled the world learning about beekeeping strategies, the cultural significance of bees, and the stories of the people who tend to them. She's committed to working for bees and their beekeepers to better understand the science and art around beekeeping. She loves to tell stories about what she learns from bee history and science, which is called apiculture. So buckle up, friends. Today we are learning all about apiculture, exploring what goes on in a beehive, and learning about the significance of bees. But before we get to that, let's take a hot second to welcome our friends joining us from all across the US and around the world. Our shout outs for this episode are going to Akshara, Barker Middle, Chavez, Clear Run Intermediate, The Cogitation Club, Connections, District of Columbia International School, Forest Park Elementary, Freedom District, all of our homeschools out there, Lazardi, Alfala, Junior High, Little Harbor, Luceno School, Miss Saponi's class, Miss L's class at PS274, Ottawa Carleton Virtual, Our Lady of Lords Regional, Pine Creek, Plum Point, RPS Online, and Williams. We're so happy to have all those school groups here. If we missed you during shout outs, don't forget to register for your next event and go ahead and sound off in the YouTube chat bar. We would love to say hi there instead. But now it's time. I'm sure we're all abuzz with excitement. Terrible joke number one. Um, take it away, Melanie. Let's learn all about bees. Hi, everybody. And let me tell you, bee puns are always welcome in my world because why not, right? <laughs> well, so nice to meet you all. And thanks for joining me today as I share a little bit with you about my story and also the importance of bees around the world and with different cultures. So I'm going to do share screen and let's make sure, let me know if you can't see it or let Celeste and Andre know if you can't see it, but hopefully you can see it. Um, and yeah, this is, you know, it's kind of interesting to share one story especially as it's still unfolding, right? But you all are at a point in your magnificent lives where you've got a few years behind you and you've got a lot of years ahead of you. And so your stories are beginning and they're going to be um, lots of different chapters in them. And so I'm just so excited to, to meet some of you as you get older and start doing your explorations and sharing your stories too. So I highly encourage you to keep track of what you're doing and to remember how you feel now, because when you get older and you think back like, oh yeah, I, I remember when this was going on and how it made me feel. And you're just going to be like, wow, you know, I've experienced a lot and I still have so much more to experience. And I really have to thank the bees for giving me all of these experiences. And I'll, I'll share with you after I show this little video about myself, um, how my path really changed. So here's a little um, digital story I made last summer about who I am and how the bees inspire me. I've traveled many a bumpy road in the darkest of nights, serving as a chauffeur to beings of sweet starlight. I migrate with them like a shepherd, roaming with my flock of winged midwives as a fellow follower of the bloom, a self-proclaimed nectar nomad. I was introduced to this artistic science of beekeeping two decades ago as a US Peace Corps volunteer collaborating with peasant farmers in South America. The bees captivated my curious mind and working in an outdoor office made of fresh air, flowers, and freedom enticed my soul. My nomadic journey as an apiculturist has taken me far from where I could ever have imagined, having come from a humble home in Pueblo Indian country in New Mexico. My heritage is a mosaic of cellular memories influenced by my Native American ancestors who instilled in me a profound reverence for place and purpose and to pursue acts of community service. So I chose to become a bee farmer as I wanted to continue to learn from Mother Nature and Father Time. As a farmer, 
I share beekeepers' voices of concern and need for adaptation and innovation to fulfill our dedication for local to global food production. Sharing their challenges, I became encouraged to return to academia to help quantify their observations and advocate for pollinator conservation. Now as a researcher, my quest to better understand the relationship between cultures, food systems, and stewardship is at the forefront of my thoughts. Honeybees are like some of us and our ancestors, immigrants to this country. They have adapted and become the backbone of agriculture. There are distinct ecotypes or subspecies of honeybees like races and humans. And these ecotypes carry genetic histories like seas which contain their very existence and memories of creation. For within each one, they have the power to nurture and adapt and the magnificence to create life, food, and medicine for the world. One of the things I most enjoy about beekeeping is that it bridges cultures and goes beyond borders. It connects us to our origins as fellow beings of light, as a part of this land, not separate from it. This magnificence is alluring and inspires me to find and connect with bees and their keepers around the globe. I invite you all to accompany me on my Nectar Nomad storytelling journey as I chase the bloom, encounter cultures, and follow the liquid starlight known as honey from flora to flavor to feast. Awesome. Some of my, my visuals are not the best because I'm getting a little bit more mature and I actually used to live before digitization. So some of my photos are, um, are dated in that way, but I'm learning how to adapt. And of course, oh, there's all these really cool schnazzy tools and technology now. So all my current photos now are much more um, clearer and crisper, but I started beekeeping in 1997. And so I had gone to school initially for marine biology fisheries. And I, um, I went to school in Florida for that. And I really got into DJing when I was out there. So my life plan really was that I knew I wanted to do Peace Corps when I graduated from college, and then I was going to move to San Francisco and be a DJ. That was my life plan. And I'll be honest with you, I still have my turntables. They're right over there. However, <laughs> um, I used to spin records and now it's all electronic. So again, I'm learning how to, how to get uh, reconnected with these really cool new ways of not only sharing stories, but sharing music and just cultural heritage in general, which is what makes our life so distinct and unique and also shareable, right? Like learning about each other and um, getting inspired by everyone's creativity. But with Peace Corps, my mother had actually served in the Peace Corps um, and she served in the French Grenadines in the Caribbean. And she actually taught Spanish down there because it was a small little fishing village um, and a little island actually, um, a little bit north of Venezuela. And so um, she had decided that when she was down there that she wanted to stay longer. And so she did, and, and she ended up staying an extra year. And on the last, one of the last few days she was there when she was taking the boat over to Barbados to catch her flight back to New Mexico, she met my dad. So I am of mixed heritage descent. I grew up here in New Mexico. I feel really connected to my Native American ancestry, but I also have Caribbean bloodlines in me. I also have Hispanic bloodlines in me and go figure, my last name is Irish. So, you know, I'm a part of the American melting pot like a lot of us here. Um, but this is a photo of me and the Peace Corps. And so when my mom had done Peace Corps, of course, you know, then they had me, they had my sister. And I just remember her talking about how it was one of the greatest experiences of her life. And so I always knew from a really young age that I wanted to serve my country too and do Peace Corps. And so it's a two-year service commitment. And <clears throat> depending on what your interests are and what your education is, they serve all over the world. You're, it's a volunteer service. It's for about two years plus a few months for training. This is me in Paraguay where I got stationed. 
in South America. And so these are Guarani descendants. So they are Guarani and Hispanic. Guarani is um, an indigenous culture there in Paraguay and also into parts of the Amazon. So I got to learn um, how to speak Guarani. Which means my name is Melanie and I work with bees. So I still remember some of that language. Um, and these were some of the youth and we had a little swimming hole um, that we would go to. Here's some of the kids that I got to hang out with. They had earthen floors and they cooked over open fires, but I got to do um, farming little garden projects with them. We did a sewing club with the women. We did a pig project too, like raising pigs. Um, and we also did beekeeping projects. So that was really, really awesome. And I learned so much while I was there that I decided that I wanted to keep working in the field and to keep working with people. And so that actually brought me to the next sort of chapter in my beekeeping experience. I made a really good friend while I was there in Peace Corps. She actually had grown up in Hawaii. She was a crop extensionist. This is actually an aerial photo of the big island of Hawaii. And this is actually called Kealakekua Bay. Captain Cook Monument is over here somewhere. But this area right here, this is actually a bee a queen bee breeding farm. And so this friend that I had made in Peace Corps, she had said, why don't you come out and help me on my mom's farm? Her mom had a small flower farm. And so then um, while I was out there, I found out that there were these queen bee rearing operations. I had no idea that there were so many facets to the beekeeping industry or to apiculture. Api in Latin means bee. And so culture means the, 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 um, practice of. So it means the, the practice of working with bees or the study of bees. And so I ended up living on the big island of Hawaii for five years, where I got to really learn about how to rear queens. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about all those different steps. Um, and then I also got to work with beekeepers from all over the world, because a lot of folks would come there. Hawaii's got pretty warm climate year round. So they're able to rear queens all year round. And so I got to work with beekeepers from Chile, France, New Zealand, Canada, Scotland, from all over. And it really opened my eyes to like, wow, I guess there's people who take care of bees all over the place. I really had, had no real idea of how extensive this particular practice is. I then actually went to go work for a migratory beekeeper in Florida. And so this is an aerial view of, um, of Florida where I was nearby. I was based in what was called Howie in the Hills, where they grow a lot of citrus. And the beekeeper I worked for, actually, he lived in Wisconsin, but he would bring his bees to Florida for the winter. And so then I got to learn, wow, you can move bees around and really far distances. Like, how does that work? Is that safe for the bees? Is that, you know, how... What is that all about? And so a lot of it is for pollination events is what they call them. So in, of course, here in the States where we have a lot of people and we have a need for a lot of food, there'll be areas where they grow just one particular crop that's called monocrop agriculture or monoculture. And it's not necessarily the best use of our land and land stewardship, how we take care of it, but there's a need during those events for a lot of pollinators at one time. And so he used to actually bring his bees down to help pollinate the citrus, but because it's Florida and there's so many different kinds of trees and there's swamp and there's the Everglades, um, the bees actually got a lot of different honeys and nectars. So some of you might even be from these places, right? While I was there, I actually met my farm partner. His name is Mark. And he's from Michigan. So now this is an aerial photo of Michigan. Um, and he's actually from the upper peninsula of Michigan. So um, it's above the main sort of landmass of the state. Lake Superior, of course, there's all the great lakes are in the area, but Lake Superior is there. And so he, he had his own small little beekeeping operation. His story is really cool because he started with just two hives, two, two packages of bees, two friends, and two books. And then as the time went on, he actually um, got really into it. His friends kind of found other things they liked. And he then went from two units of bees to five to 17 hives of he didn't know what. He said bees were swarming in the trees. And he was like, I got to go work for a professional. So he went to go work for this beekeeper in Florida. And that's where we met. And so we teamed up um, 18 years ago. And so we used to 
take his bees, which we multiply because I knew how to rear queens now, we would take um, some of them to Florida, then some of them to Michigan, and then we would do um, Florida, New Mexico, because that's where I'm from, and then Michigan, New Mexico. But for the past, um, I'd say about 15 years, we're now really fully based in New Mexico, which is my home state. But I had never kept bees in my home area. So it took me a while to learn how to keep bees here. So I specialize in what's called queen bee rearing. And um, I'll show you this little process here. This is up at our farm. Um, and I actually took me, I think, a while. Not I knew how to rear queens, but it took me a while to figure out how to select queens. So I consider myself a seed saver. And some people save seeds of plants, right? But for me, I save seeds of bees. So the bees are like seeds. And I find the ones that are naturally resilient, naturally um, hardy, that can handle different climates, that are productive, that are pest and disease resistant. And then I help nurture new queen mamas from those lines of bees. And then I can share them with beekeepers all over. So this is actually me doing a process called grafting and grafting in beekeeping is actually different than plant grafting and plant grafting. You're kind of cutting pieces off and putting them together, but in beekeeping and in queen rearing more specifically, it just actually means I'm transferring larva. So here's a little photo here of kind of the steps of how I make a queen. So it starts up here in the upper left and here I am sitting doing my, um, doing my graft. So this frame that I'm looking into is actually from a select breeder colony. So I like to select for longevity because it makes sense to me. I want bees that live a long time and it's a heritable trait, meaning it can be passed on. So what I do is I, I let my bees be bees. I keep them in different places. I actually don't own any land. So, um, I've been creative in how I find spaces for my bees. I coordinate with other farmers in my area who need pollination and who are willing to share space. And so I'm able to put my bees in different places. And then not only do my bees get to have different kinds of forage and nutrition, there's different flowers and different bloom times. So I also get a little bit of um, a variety of honeys too, which I'll show you a slide of, but I'm also able to test those bees in those different areas. And then the ones that, um, that really can make it through several years and that stay really productive, those are the ones then that are my mother seeds or the breeders, and I'm able to nurture daughters. So to nurture those daughters, I transfer the larvae, and you can't see this picture that well, but there's these little crescents in there that are the larvae. You can kind of see one up here at the top. And they're in these blue cups, which are actually the same shape and size as a natural queen cell cup. And I just transfer the larva floating on royal jelly, then they go into a nursery hive and they turn, they actually keep feeding them royal jelly. And you can see this middle photo, these long things that look like peanuts in their shell, those are actually queen bee cocoons. And so the, the queens and all the bees actually will undergo a process of metamorphosis, just like butterflies do. They start off as small, they start off as an egg actually, then they hatch, then they become a larva, and then they're fed a bunch of royal jelly and they're also fed, um, bee bread if they're going to be a worker bee, but they're, they continue to be fed royal jelly if they're going to be a queen. And then they actually um, will spin a cocoon and they'll metamorphosize in there. And then when they come out, they're an adult bee. So the queens then, we actually handle them very carefully. This is my partner, Mark, over here carrying the queen cells. We take them out to what we call a mating apiary. We put them um, each in a new home. And so this is me handling one here in the bottom middle, putting it right in the middle of what we call the brood nest. That brood means babies. So that's where they're, they're rearing new babies. And then three weeks later, we go back and we have a queen who not only has emerged, but she's gone on her mating flights. So you can see in this bottom right photo, there's a little blue dot. That's the queen. We actually use um, a non-toxic, no odor, uh, water-based paint to put a little dot on her back. And one, that's because it's a lot easier to find a queen in a hive full of thousands upon thousands of bees if you can spot her easily. But also there's an international color code. So every year the color changes. And so when we can put a color dot on her for the year, then we know how old she is. And so that's how I'm able to select the oldest ones to be able to pass along those, those heritable genes of longevity. And then when we harvest these queens, they each go in a little cage 
age. They have attendants, which are some of their daughters who help to feed them. This picture right here has um, little drops of honey on top because they're going to get ready to get shipped. And then I ship them to beekeepers all over. Some beekeepers come to the farm to pick up. Others I'll meet somewhere, but then there are some that are just too far away. And so I can ship them the queens and I have to, of course, be really careful. I pack them in a nice insulated box with a little sponge for water and with, and actually these cages have a little tube of fondant. So they have food for the travel. I'm going to play this real short little video of sort of the process um, that I follow for rearing queens. Let's see if it'll play here. Everybody would like to try and find something that is perfect for where they're at. The super plant, the super bee. And Mother Nature doesn't have, you know, a one size fits all uh, model. Um, and rightly so. I mean, just look at the varying landscapes of the world. Seventy percent of the food we eat is pollinated by bees or has, has some derivation from honeybee pollination. Bees are a very integrative part of, you know, human uh, evolution and of course just um, food production. And so we run our bees through the mountains and the valleys. Um, we like having our bees up here in the mountains during the summer because there's a really good flow. We do keep some here for the winter for overwintering assessment. We are surrounded by forests. We've got Santa Fe National Forest, Pecos National Forest, and Carson National Forest all kind of converge right here in the Southern Rockies. People need hardy bees. If you have naturally hardy bees, then the hope is that they're strong enough on their own to deal with the, what I call the diversity and adversity, um, the, the, you know, the changing conditions. And here in New Mexico, we have so many different microclimates. And so having bees that can um, adapt to the varying conditions is, is really important, at least for us, because we've chosen to live here. Queen rearing um, is extremely uh, satisfying work for me, I think, in that it's, you know, queens are the heart of their hive. They're the ones that are passing on the lineage. They're the ones that are, are giving, you know, their progeny the ability to deal or not deal with certain situations. You know, one of the differences that we do with our rearing is we select our own breeders. We purposely give everybody two years. We don't, we don't requeen every year and just get rid of, you know, only keep young queens. The older they are, the better they are for us in what we do because we feel that if they've lasted that long, then they can really handle a lot. And that's the type of genetics, naturally, that we want to promote. Out of all the thousands of bees in a hive, there's only one queen bee. And, um, you know, they're very committed and they have very devoted followers. Uh, hives will create a new queen under certain conditions. Um, in our situation, we mimic some of these conditions. These are our cell builders, and they're actually making queens. The, you know, the queen is in the couple bottom boxes, laying away, that's her main nursery. And the bigger the hive gets, the more boxes we add. And the more boxes that you add, the ones on the top can't smell her pheromones as strongly. So when you give them the right age larva, they will make them into queens. These are all gonna be new mamas. When these queens emerge, they will pipe um, to find the other queens. And they'll go, ring, 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 ring. <laughs> to me, it sounds really funny because I've, I mean, I've heard it so many times, but it does, it's really high pitched and it just sounds like little, you know, uh, Morse code vibration, like And then they will find each other and then um, fight to the death. And may the winter rain, I guess. Any bees he can say that you made from mud and clay and the nest you have. So that video was actually made um, a while ago and I noticed they just put thanks to Melanie, Mark, and Isis. Isis is my daughter. I also now have a son who's 10. So this was made before he was even born. <laughs> His name is SIE. And um, 
They, of course, help with the bee stuff. They, their favorite thing to do is eat honey, of course, but, um, but they tolerate our beekeeping. And so they've, they've grown up um, on the farm and helping with some of the things. And we'll see if they, it's something they want to do. That's great. But um, we're not going to force them to do it because they're creative and they have their own interests, right? So this is actually a photo of us. Um, this is actually Mark in Michigan with one of his hives. And because it's so far north, the daylight's really long up there. And so even though it's a shorter season because it's really cold, the bees can actually pack away a lot of honey. So what we do is we add boxes to give them more space and then they can grow in population and fill it with honey. So some of them can get really tall, even taller than us. And each one of those boxes, I kid you not, can weigh almost a hundred pounds. They can be really, really heavy. So, um, one of the things I like about queen rearing is that the queens are really light. I don't have to, <laughs> they're not so heavy to pick up. <laughs> So here's those ripe cocoons, and you can see up at the top right here of each one of these little cups, all this white um, goop in there, that's the royal jelly, which is age defying. It's, it's really got a lot of vitamins and minerals. And so the queen gets fed that her whole life, and that's what allows her to live several years. Whereas um, the worker bees or her daughters, they'll only live a few weeks in the summer. And they have different jobs throughout their, their lifespan. In the winter, they can live several months because they're not working so much, right? But the queen is the only one who actually can live several years. And unfortunately, due to varying um, agricultural practices, we're finding now that these queens aren't living as long. And so um, it's been one of my missions to really try and find those queens, those seeds, right, that can live a really long time and then be able to pass on those good genetics. So there's a queen right there. Again, we put this little um, non-toxic paint dot on her back. These bees are around her, that's called her retinue, and they basically are passing her pheromones. So pheromones are like perfumes and each queen smells different. So that's how the bees know that they're in the right hive. They recognize the way their mama smells, right? And so they're able to, um, to stay uh, really allegiant to their one queen. If there's another queen in there, they will actually find her probably to be an imposter and they might attack her. And so, um, so when we rear queens, we have to really uh, follow the natural processes and their own, their own behavior. We have to respect the bees behavior. So every time we have a new cocoon, we give them a whole new family of bees. And it's usually bees that um, we borrowed from another hive that had a queen, but we let them sit for a couple days without a queen. And so then they're really excited to have a new one. Um, What's also really cool about working with bees is just the fact that there's all these different flowers and all these different landscapes. So the bees have really taught me more about how to pay attention. You know, some people think those are weeds and I go, dandelions aren't weeds. Those are feeding all the bees and pollinators. So when you start learning more about what the bees need, um, it really does open your eyes to just how interconnected everything is and how different cultures actually learn to work with bees. So of course, one of the cool things is discovering all these flavors. Each flower smells different, right? So each of their nectars smells different and they're in competition with each other to attract pollinators. But these are some of the varying honeys that bees can, um, can make from the nectars of these different flowers. So this is a photo here of honey that's from different places around the world. And even here in New Mexico, when I harvest honey in the spring from one spring, one place. If I harvest honey again in the fall from the same place, the, the honeys can look very different and taste very different because the flowers have changed each season, right? So here's part of my collection of honey. This has um, a lot of honey from Italy because I got to take a trip there for an organization called Slow Food, which looks to really um, promote um, uh, farmers and farming practices and food practices that are really rooted in, um, in uh, cultural um cultural uh ways right this is honey over here on the left i think this is um kenyan honey i've also got right up here this one with the blue cap is actually from stingless bees in from the tropics so there's all different kinds of honey and i i've become really a honey collector because they're all different so some people collect hats or shoes or you know stamps or or coins or what have you um, I like to collect honey and the bees have really taken me around the world. I've been able to go to do projects in Jamaica. This is me working with some youth. Um, we're making some beeswax pendants. Um, I also got to, oops, sorry here. 
my keyboard is acting glitchy. I got to go visit beekeepers in Morocco in North Africa, which was just amazing. And these folks were really, they're like, our bees are super mean. So I was expecting their bees to be really feisty, but they really weren't that feisty. Um, not as feisty as the ones that I worked with in South America. So that's something else that's really cool about bees is that just like humans, there's different races. And so while the bees can all, um, the honeybees in particular can intermate and, and, interact with each other. Some of them are really um, more conditioned to a particular environment. So like the bees that are in Morocco are going to be very different than the bees say that are in Germany, right? Where it's colder and it's a different landscape. So the bees have learned how to adapt to these different areas and they originated in Africa and the Middle East. And then as they spread out on their own following different flowers and blooms, you know, they learned how to adapt to those local conditions. And so they became their own, what we call ecotypes, which is really cool. I wanna make sure I save time for questions. So I'm gonna breeze through this um, pretty quickly, but we've shared the link with you all so that then you can see the, the full presentation at your leisure if you wanna go back and check it out. This here is some of the honeys I collect here in New Mexico. Um, and you can see how they all look different colors, right? And even different consistencies. This one in the middle looks almost like milk and it's thick and creamy and it does that just naturally. So honey will crystallize. It's got so much vitamins and minerals in it and just plant sugars from the nectar that no bacteria can can live in it. So they've even found honey in Egyptian tombs that is still edible to this day. It's 3000 years old and it's never gone bad. So honey pretty much has an infinite shelf life. It's pretty amazing stuff. Um, I was able to visit beekeepers in France as well. Some of you may have heard, um, this was a few years ago when there was um, a fire at Notre Dame church. This is the family that actually has the bees on top of the roof there, not on the very top of the church, but on the clergyman's quarters, which are right next to the church. This is Kenton Jayant, and him and his dad have a, a little company called Biopic. They live in Versailles, which is right near Paris, and so it's a, it's a big city. So what they do is they keep bees on the rooftops of different places, from the Louvre to Notre Dame to all these famous and kind of iconic buildings, and then they're able to share the honey with those varying companies and organizations for them to share how they want to. So they also help to pollinate all the different trees and parks and flowers that are in those parks in the city. These are beekeepers in Italy that I got to visit. And here's another picture of the folks in Morocco that I got to visit. Um, one of the cool things too about visiting folks and seeing how bees and how people interact with bees really, um, it inspired me to go back to school. So I went back and got my master's degree. I just finished in May and it was after I had already been in the field for 20 some years. So it's never too late to go back to school. And in fact, I want to keep going. I'm hoping to get my doctorate at some point, but this is some of the research that I did, um, which is, uh, working to look at, um, how honeybees mate. And so I used little RFID tracking devices, these little stickers, they don't hurt the bee, but then they actually um, are just like a sticker on their back. And then as they fly through these little tubes with antennas, we can get a date and time stamp. So what's really cool is I got to learn from the bees themselves, from working with people who work with bees from cultural aspects, and then also the science. So really at this point, I call myself an interdisciplinarian. And of course I love to write and storytell. So sharing all of this with folks, I feel really is, um, can be more meaningful, not only for me, but I'm hoping that it can help inspire others to find what moves them and what they're, um, what they become passionate about. So I'm going to wrap it up here, um, but I, we, like I said, we're going to share this, um, this link with you so that if you want to go back and see it later, you can. And I was just talking about storytelling, which I'm doing now, working with bees and beekeepers, um, research I've done on different plants and bees. So there's all sorts of cool stuff. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop share and that way we have time for questions. The last question for this event, I'm going to combine questions from our students in the Philippines and our middle schoolers at Plum Point, who combined are wondering what's the biggest threat bees are facing and why is working with them and protecting them so important to biodiversity and our ecosystems? Excellent question. So, you know, they are being threatened. A lot of it has to do with loss of habitat, right? Um, and especially with shifting climate, which we're hearing a lot more about in the news, you know, we can kind of look at the situation as like, oh, doom and gloom, woe is us. But actually, 
we've got all these other animals that have learned how to adapt over the years that have survived ice ages and all these other things. And so part of the way they've done that is they've learned how to adapt and they've learned how to work together and really how to work with their landscape. And so we humans, we're kind of a younger species here, right? We can learn a lot from our animal friends and even our plant friends or what we call our plant relatives. Um, and so I think it's really important that we recognize how interconnected we are. We all have to share um, water. We all have to share air. We all have to share space with all of these other organisms, right? So if we really want to survive ourselves, we want all these other organisms to survive too. And so I think by really being mindful about how we um, practice our stewardship, um, the choices that we make, right? If we keep buying plastic bottles that aren't able to be recycled, then that's going to be a real problem. It already is a real problem, right? But there are people changing and the more people that um, really advocate for change, then we're going to see the companies start to take notice and they're going to try and start making changes too, because that's what the people want and that's how you know they rely on us and we also rely on them so we all are interconnected um and i think it's just it's the bees for me have been such a mind opening organism because individually they're an organism but together they're a super organism so like you know there's me there's you there's celeste there's your teachers there's your mom and dad but all together we're a society right? And we are all working together and we all want to have um, a healthy life and a long life and one that we enjoy. So um, same with our animal and plant friends. So it's a matter of just really practicing um, conscientious stewardship and making uh, mindful choices about what your space is and how you want it to be. And you really have the power to, to be the change that you want to see. So if you don't like something, try and make it better. And share your story. A, That's how you do it. You share your stories. <laughs> what a fabulous final answer to leave us with. Thank you so much for doing this fascinating work and for taking the time to hang out with us and share it. Thank you to your students out there for the spectacular questions. I wish we could answer every single one. And thanks to teachers for going above and beyond and making cool stuff like this happen. Happy Native American Heritage Month to everyone out there. We encourage you to make some extra time to learn and celebrate this month. And as a quick reminder, time change is coming up here in the United States. That's going to happen on November 7th. So if you join us from outside of the U.S., double check your time zone conversions for next week. We don't want to miss you. Um, I hope to see you all at some of our upcoming events, including seals from space, uh, elephant seal stuff, ice cores, all kinds of good stuff. A uh, big batch of new events is about to hit our website. So Stay, stay tuned there. Be sure to register your group for a shout out and a chance to be featured up here on screen. Have a fabulous day. Stay curious, keep exploring, and we'll see you back here soon. Bye folks. Thanks everyone. Thanks for all your questions.